So if you're gonna watch this video, you're probably a citizen developer, an office developer, maybe even a tech leader in your organization who's trying to figure out how to leverage Microsoft 365, maybe SharePoint, uh, and some of the other tools in a better way. Um, and more specifically, you probably got a challenge where maybe you've got a bunch of apps that are built on SharePoint and you're dealing with frustration with building those apps and you're wondering about Dataverse and the Power Platform. Or maybe you're even just getting started and you're like, well, SharePoint's free, Dataverse costs money. Like, how do I make a decision on what should be the data backend for my application? And so my goal with this video is to kind of give you the, the five key things that you should be thinking about when you're making that decision. And along the way, I'm gonna frame these things in the context of my experience as an office developer for the last 15, 20 years so that you can have a good mindset. Okay, so the first reason that you might wanna consider moving away from SharePoint as your backend data store for your apps, your Office apps, to something like Dataverse as a backend for your Office apps is actually because your life will be so much better once you finally get there. Now, this is kind of like, I could tell you that, you know, you'll never really understand what it means to love someone until you get married or have kids or something like that. And it's true, words can't express what that's like, and it's kind of the same here. Like, I can't even, express to you what it means to use Dataverse as a backend as a Office developer versus SharePoint. So you need to kind of try it for yourself and then make that judgment. And I'm here to tell you that it's way better. So if you're sitting down and watching this video, chances are you're probably interested in similar content related to this. Uh, if you do, be sure to like this video and then subscribe to the channel for more. All right, so the next reason why you might wanna move away from SharePoint and to something like Dataverse is the complexity of your data. So some key questions here, and if you answer yes to these, that's gonna be a clue that maybe it's time to think about moving. Question number one, does your app utilize more than one list or library out of SharePoint? So if your answer is yes to that, there's your sign. Question number two, are your lists related to each other? So are you using lookup columns? Are you trying to actually relate data uh, in some sort of way? That's another sign. And then the third question is, are you modeling many-to-many -many relationships? So uh, that's a more complex data model where you can have two things on one end and they can each be related to more than one uh, record in the other side. Um, that's a many-to-many -many relationship. That's a rather complex thing to do and frankly, quite tricky to do inside of SharePoint um, and creates a lot of complexity in your app. Uh, ultimately, when you try to you know, model it in SharePoint and then use it inside of something like a Canvas app. So of all of the reasons I'm going to talk about in this uh, video, this is probably my favorite and I think this is the biggest win. So if you think about this in terms of the complexity of your data model, the more complex your model is, the more efficiency you can gain by moving away from SharePoint and into Dataverse. So think of a scenario where you, you've, let's say, got a few lists in SharePoint and they're related through lookup columns. The amount of time that you're going to spend uh, developing, let's say, your Canvas app based on those relationships uh, increases the more relationships, the more lists that you have. And so one of the beautiful things about Dataverse is that you can model that those relationships and those, the knowledge of those relationships when you bring those connections into your Canvas app is just there. You don't have to do the extra collects and clear collects and all of those things to build you know, data sets inside of your Canvas app. It just works. So you save yourself a bunch of time and then lastly, I think the way that you should think about that cost um, and the efficiency that you gain is Yes, you're gonna pay for licenses with Dataverse, but how much does that cost you versus how much time you're actually gonna spend dealing with all of the goofy SharePoint relationships, list relationships, lookup columns, and all of that stuff in your app and having to build for that. All right, reason number three is a pretty well-documented one. It's delegation limits. So anybody who's been an Office developer and has been working with SharePoint, maybe you've worked with the SharePoint API, uh, you've learned pretty quickly one of the key limitations of the SharePoint API and lists for that matter is the 5,000 row limit. So the minute that you get more than 5,000 items in your list, things start to fall apart. And then beyond that, if you're building Canvas apps in the Power Platform, there's actually an even lower limit. It's 2,000 rows of data that can actually be brought in uh, in a single request. Um, so that's the limitation. So if you've got more than 2,000 rows, you've got to do some extra things. You've got to come up with some pretty hairy strategies actually inside of a Canvas app to pull pages of data in and put it into a single collection in memory so that you can actually be effective with it. Um, and then more specifically, and this is pretty well documented, there are delegation limits on SharePoint data uh, as you're 
filtering or doing lookups and, and that type of thing, retrieving that data in data sets from SharePoint. And you'll see those things uh, noted in your Canvas app. You'll get like a little warning icon and it'll tell you that there's a delegation warning there and you need to do something different to, to you know, resolve that issue. And the key problem there is that if you have, you know, let's say more than 2,000 rows and you're trying to go directly against your SharePoint list and let's say you're trying to apply a filter where you're getting that delegation warning. So, so what that means is you can't push that criteria, that matching logic down to SharePoint reliably because it can only do so, apply it to so many rows. And so the risk there is that you're gonna get data back, yes, that matches your filter, but it won't have applied that filter to all 10,000 rows that are in your SharePoint list, right? So then you have bad data in your application and that leads to a whole nother world of problems. So that's a reason, like the minute that you're over 2,000 rows and you're building a Canvas app, Think about switching to Dataverse where you can kind of remove those delegation limitations. Uh, or if you've got 5,000 rows in your SharePoint list, right, that's another key sign that you need to be moving to something other than SharePoint uh, to make your life easier. And again, this is one of those ones where you're going to weigh the cost of the licensing versus the amount of effort involved as a developer in working around those delegation limits. Um, so if you're interested in this particular issue, we have some links that we're going to post in the description that will tell you all about the delegation uh, limits in SharePoint. All right, reason number four is all about application lifecycle management. And the key question here is, is your application mission critical? Or is it core to your, the function of your, your organization? So there are some key questions that you can kind of ask yourself to determine that. So like, how do I know? Um, and those key questions are things like, how bad would it be if my application went down or was not stable for, let's say, a half day, right? Um, would you lose revenue in that scenario? Uh, would people be sitting around with nothing to do? because your application is down. So if your answer to any of those things is like, yeah, but I would lose revenue or people would be sitting around with nothing to do and that's bad, um, then chances are application lifecycle management matters to you. Some of the things that are gonna have to change uh, in order for you to, to treat it that way are gonna be things like changes to the application should be peer reviewed. So you've probably heard of code reviews, right? Somebody's paying attention to what the changes are and saying, yeah, that looks good to me or no, maybe you should think about this a little bit differently and maybe change something before it goes out. Um, you're also gonna have a dedicated testing environment. Um, so you might even have a dev environment, a testing environment, validation and production environment. Um, so that's all part of application lifecycle management. And then you're also gonna do something like plan when the outage should occur or plan when the deployment should occur so that it's maybe not during business hours uh, or plan the way that it happens so that it's gonna have minimal impact uh, to your end users. Now, SharePoint has some things that you can use to manage toward that end. Things like site templates, site scripting, and content types uh, all can be used in that way, but they're not designed for that purpose. Um, so all of those things have been like, used like, throughout my career as ways to manage around that problem. Um, and so we'll have multiple SharePoint sites representing you know, dev, test, prod, where somebody can actually look at different things. But it's not a small task to try to manage the, the differences in the rollout of um, changes between those different SharePoint sites and therefore your applications. So the good news on the Dataverse side is that the Power Platform actually has features and documented processes that are already designed for this purpose specifically. So the idea there is that you would build your application in a Dataverse enabled environment. Uh, you would uh, build all of those components, tables, forms, views, uh, Canvas apps, all of those things inside of a solution. Um, and then you can use that solution to go from dev environment to test environment to production. Um, and so that can be a kind of a fully managed soup to nuts uh, application lifecycle as it progresses through those different environments. And then beyond that, there are even pipelines now built into the Power Platform that can be configured to manage that deployment. So you can do things like uh, deploy to a validation environment where somebody can get some eyes on you know, each iteration before it goes to test. Um, and then once they're happy with it, somebody can push a button and the pipeline then packages it all up and deploys that version to test where the QA team gets to actually put hands on it, make sure that everything's good before somebody then approves that release and it gets pushed to production. So all of that stuff is built in to the Power Platform. And so I would encourage you to use that uh, as a way to deploy your applications if your apps are mission critical. And so if you're curious about what ALM might look like in the Power Platform, we're gonna post some additional links to some more of our content that deals specifically with application lifecycle management. So the last official reason I'm gonna include in this video is security. So if you're familiar with SharePoint security at all, you know that you have you know, the three basic uh, levels. You have visitors, members, and owners. 
Um, and then you have permissions that are associated with each of those like read, contribute, full control. Now, you can also create your own custom permission uh, levels that have you know, a variety of different things. Um, and you can even do item level permission, um, but that is somewhat limited. So when you do item level permission, for example, uh, you configure it at the list level or at the library level, and you're going to let somebody modify something that they have created, for example. Um, but that's about as far as it goes. So that's pretty simple. When you move to Dataverse, however, it's next level, right? There's a whole world of security roles and uh, permissions uh, in the in the model can almost be overwhelming. Uh, the first time you look at it, certainly it will be overwhelming. Um, but once you dig in and start to understand it, it becomes much more clear. The nice things about it is you get the ability to control record ownership. So you, the way you define your tables, you're going to define them with a couple different types of ownership. But that, what that means is that your records can be owned by a user, a team, a business unit, or the organization. And so uh, what that means is whatever team I'm a member of has ownership rights over a particular record and we can all modify that record. A record could be uh, owned by a specific user, which means only that user can modify that record. So there's a really nice model for controlling access to item level data. In addition to that, the permission levels themselves, like just to give you kind of a basic overview, are things like create, update, read, write, delete, and append, all of the things you uh, would expect. Um, and then you can, in addition to those things, you can even implement column level security so, such that you can uh, allow certain fields, for example, to be accessible, editable, viewable by certain security roles or certain team members uh, that have access to your application. So that can be a, a huge benefit and something that's not very easily implemented inside of a SharePoint type environment. And one extra little note is you can even do things like restrict specific forms or tailor forms that are geared for specific uh, use cases and uh, teams or security roles. And that's more prevalent on the model-driven app side of things, um, but that can be a, a, a rather convenient way to manage the way that a particular group of users accesses a particular set of data uh, and therefore very useful. And a little reminder about our community, The Workplace, where you can actually connect with other people who are trying to solve similar problems uh, in a collaborative way, post your questions, get answers, get direct help for your uh, particular situation. I would encourage you to check that out. There's a link in the description. All right, so in conclusion, I think the first thing that I want to say to you is kudos for making it this far. It means you're giving this problem some thought, you're wrestling with it and trying to figure out you know, what the best way forward is. And I would encourage you to like, keep going down that path. I think you'll find some good things. I'll tell you from my own personal experience, the first time that I like, picked up Dataverse uh, a few years ago and actually was like, okay, I'm gonna try to figure out how to use this because you know, maybe there's a better way. Um, it was frustrating. Like I looked at it with a, just a little bit of information and it was like, oh, where is everything at? I gotta, you know, figure out this new system. And I wasn't quite sure, you know, where it would go. And then of course the licensing cost was a hit and like all of those things kind of worked against me and it seemed more frustrating. Uh, the, I would say the frustration was bigger than the benefits at that time. Um, but the truth is after that, I think I tried it maybe twice. Uh, and tried building a couple apps with it. And after that, the frustration all went away. I was sold. Uh, it saves me so much time uh, anyways as a developer, an office developer, to build things on Dataverse. Um, I would recommend it to anybody. Uh, the, the key there is, is making the, the case uh, for the licensing cost more than anything else. There is obviously the governance that needs to be wrapped around it, uh, but if you can sort those things out, uh, your world as a Office developer will be much, much better. And that's why Dataverse has become an essential tool in our team's Office Developer Toolkit. So that's all I got for today. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time. Like it's very interesting because when it first was a thing a few years ago, it's probably five years ago now.